Lucy mentioned, I lead this group called CLIMA, the Climate Modeling Alliance, which is about 70 mathematicians, computer scientists, earth scientists, software engineers at Caltech, at MIT, at JPL. And what we want to do is make climate science more accurate, make it faster so that we can adapt to what is coming. So where we are, you have seen figures like this, I'm sure before. This is earth temperature over the last um, 140 some years. The earth temperatures have been increasing, especially since the 1970s. We've had about 1.2 degrees centigrade warming since the mid 19th century already. Um, the Conference of the Parties, the 27th edition just started of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And as many of you know, the Paris Agreement stipulated that we should limit warming to two degrees, ideally 1.5 degrees. We already have 1.2 degrees warming, so we have 0 0.8 degrees to go to two degrees, so 0 0.3 to 1.5 degrees, and that we will reach pretty soon. Um, conferences are all about reducing greenhouse gas emissions. That will have to happen. It's important to keep in mind that right now, greenhouse gas emissions globally are still rising. You see these are total greenhouse gas emissions. It's carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and the like. They are still going up. There is a larger share of renewables now, but the renewables that do not lead in, in energy production, but the renewables have not led to a reduction in emissions so far. Um, they've added energy production. So if we would want to limit global warming to two degrees, we would need to drastically cut global emissions. So here are some scenarios of how we may stay below, below two degrees warming, so only 0 0.8 degrees to go. And all of these scenarios have in common that emissions would need to peak in the next two or three years and then drastically go down in the next seven, eight years or so by say 27% by 2030 to have a chance to limit warming to around two degrees. If you were about to limit warming to 1.5 degrees, emissions would have to be cut by almost half by 2030. Now, I don't think that's terribly realistic to achieve, but it's good to illustrate the problem. So what this means is that I think at best, we will need to learn to live in a world that will be about two degrees warmer than in pre-industrial times. A warmer atmosphere, a warmer earth is loading the dice for extreme events. Warmer atmosphere especially has more water vapor in it and more water vapor means intense rain will get more intense. Here's just one example. This is, was Hurricane Harvey in Texas in 2017. It was devastating there. And scientists have estimated that the probability of rainfall like what occurred during Harvey, the probability of that occurring was roughly tripled by the climate changes that has already occurred. So if you would want to uh, make a musical analogy here is we are used to the rhythms, the themes, the tunes of climate over the last 11,000 years or so, the Holocene, the time when humans uh, settled, built cities and the like. This is what we are used to. And we'll have to get used to and improvise living in a, a very different climate with different rhythms, shifts in the seasonal cycle, with uh, different intensities of rainstorms and the like. And what we are doing at Klima, at Caltech, is trying to figure out what these rhythms will be, what are the tunes and themes of climate in the future, what is it we'll have to get used to. And the way we do it is we build models of the climate system, so physical models, model winds, temperatures, storms, and the like. And we are informing those models with data, satellite data from space, for example, or data from floats in the ocean to represent especially small scale processes that are hard to capture in climate models. So for example, clouds. Clouds are very small in scale. They have scales of meters to tens of meters. And the climate model has a mesh on which we compute winds and temperatures. And that mesh is pretty coarse. It's maybe hundred kilometers on the side. So clouds literally fall through the cracks. And we use data to represent clouds in climate models because they are crucially important for understanding climate change, the climate we'll get. Clouds are very important for Earth energy balance and how much warmer it will get depends very much on what clouds will do. And that's, that is sort of day-to-day -day research is figuring out 
how these small scale processes like clouds, like ocean turbulence or the land biosphere will react to climate change and putting all of that in big computer models. And what we want to do with it in the end is produce climate predictions that everyone and all of you can use. Ideally, it would be things appearing on your phone that you can use to uh, make decisions about real estate purchases or in the financial sector, um, decisions about risks of investments or planning in the developing world, which areas will be safe to build on, which ones won't and the like. And our mission is to get to the point that everyone has access to good climate information in for decision making, that any decision that has a reach of a decade or so will be informed, will have to be informed by climate change, and we want to help inform those decisions. So this is what I do as a scientist. And again, I think the, the musical analogy, we've seen these wonderful dances, the music we've heard, our job as a society and the job for all of us will be to improvise to new rhythms, to new tunes that the climate system will have in store for us, things we have never heard before that have not occurred this way in uh, during human existence on Earth.